Good morning. Welcome to Northview Community Church on April 19th. We continue to be in the season of Easter. Easter lasts for 50 days, so hopefully you haven't taken down all your decorations yet. But we're so glad that you have joined us here this morning at Northview Community Church as we gather together separately, um, an introvert's dream and an extrovert's nightmare. We really hope that you're doing okay. We're very glad that you've tuned in, and we are praying this morning that our worship together is going to be honoring of God and growing us as men and women and children of Jesus. This morning, we're going to begin our service with a call to worship. Uh, in the season of Easter, I wanted to find a call to worship that was going to be bright and really call us to the activity of worship. So Psalm 96 uh, perfectly encapsulates the kind of attitude that we are meant to have. So hear Psalm 96 this morning as we gather together to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory. Do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's continue to worship this morning and pray. Heavenly Father, the God of all the nations of the world, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray this morning as we come to you in worship that you would take us in your arms, that you would gather us together, that we might experience your loving embrace this morning as we come for the activity of worship. We pray this morning, Lord, that your name would be lifted high. We pray that this would not just be something that we do on a Sunday morning together, but that this might be our attitude and our lifestyle Sunday to Sunday. Lord, you are good. This morning, as we gather, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on us once again. We pray that you would fill us up full to overflowing with the presence of your spirit, that you would make yourself manifest to us in our day-to-day -day lives, that the joy of the Lord would overflow in our hearts. And even as the psalm has proclaimed, will overflow to our neighbors around us, to all the nations of the earth we pray, Lord, that they might hear this good news that incorporates us into Christ and gathers us together as one people. This morning, Lord, as we prepare to worship, we pray that you would prepare our hearts for an encounter with you 
that even as we participate in the service electronically, that you would touch us, that you would connect with us, and that we wouldn't, wouldn't leave this virtual gathering unchanged. We pray for the ongoing work of transformation of your spirit. And Lord, this morning, one of the acts of worship is to give of our money, to give our tithes and our offerings. Lord, we recognize that you require no money from us, that everything in the earth belongs to you. And yet, you have called us to be a faithful and generous people who give as an act of worship, to give an offering. And we recognize that money is a power that can have a hold over our lives. And so, as we let go, as we give freely and cheerfully, we pray, Lord, that your name would be blessed, that this would be an investment in your kingdom, that you would give us wisdom and a sense of responsibility as we use that to do ministry and particularly to see your gospel go out into our neighborhoods and as we care for our neighbors around us. So Lord, for all the gifts that you have given us, we bless your name and we give back a portion of what you have given to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we've been praying about the offering, we do want to give you some time to take a moment, take out your uh, cellular device, if you like, um, go online and, and go ahead and engage in the act of worship of giving. On your screen, there's uh, many different options for how you can give, um, lots of ways that you can give um, through, through apps automatically or pre-authorized debit just follow those instructions, or you can mail a check to our physical address, or you can email the office and we will arrange to have your offering picked up in a non-contact safe way. As we continue to worship, um, this week we sent out our electronic bulletin to you. If you would like to um, subscribe to getting that weekly electronic bulletin. If you're not on that list, you can do so by just emailing office at northview.sk.ca and we'll be happy to add you to that. Uh, the bulletin is a, a weekly um, blast that goes out and it's a great way to stay connected and up to date with what is happening in the life and ministry of our church as well we use that for um, prayer requests or a pray chain and so that can keep you up to date with the life of your brothers and sisters in this community so there are um, two announcements that we want to emphasize from the bulletin this morning the first one is about our discovery land. Again, we just want to remind you parents, particularly as you are caught at home, if you are looking for material to continue Christian education with your kids to help them continue to be engaged in discipling, then uh, Sarah, our discovery land curriculum leader, is putting together curriculum every week and we're posting that on our website. So there is a, a link on your screen uh, where you can go and you can go ahead and download that curriculum as well. There's a link there for the weekly video uh, and you can click that link and watch the video and you'll be all prepared to help your kids with uh, talking about Jesus and life with Jesus. The second um, announcement that we want to emphasize from the bulletin is again about our random blessings. Um, so Pastor Belinda is continuing to collect materials, things like canned food, um, gift cards, that sort of thing. There's details in your bulletin. You can drop them off on a basket on her um, side porch right at her house. She is cleaning those, getting them packaged up, and then we have people that are, are doing contactless delivery uh, to houses. Like we said, we were able to bless nine families for Easter, and this week we've been able to reach out and actually connect with a member of our community who needed some help, and we were able to bless them. So your care items, your offerings are going to helping our neighbors and caring for 
um, people who are in need. So we would encourage you to think about how you can participate in that. We're also going to um, do a special reveal of a plaque that we have made for the 100-year um, year celebration. Uh, we had intended to meet on May 2nd to do a 100-year celebration worship service, and unfortunately, we can't do that. Um, that's postponed until things become a little more secure. However, we do want to keep in mind that it is 100 years that we are celebrating, so we have had a plaque made, and we want to reveal that to you now. So check out this video. In 1920, Reverend Lada Babcock came from Ontario to Regina, Saskatchewan to start this new work with the Free Methodist Church in Canada here in Regina. And so 100 years later, we stand here and we want to commemorate this work that God has been doing through the Free Methodist Church here in Regina. And we wanted to commission a new plaque that would com commemorate uh, the people that God has raised up over these last hundred years um, to lead this work. So the, the hundred year committee with the help of Suzette Seeley has produced this plaque. And here we have the names of the lead pastors for the last hundred years who have been serving this community. And really this plaque is meant to represent all the men, women, and children who have faithfully been taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to our neighbors uh, here in Regina and doing this good work. So this is a way to celebrate our history as well as a reminder that we are leaving a legacy behind ourselves. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you have put that um, that desire on the hearts of Lada Babcock, the way that she has come and begun this work. We thank you for the men and women and children who came after her, the work that they have done to see your gospel go out to our neighborhoods, to every man, woman, and child in the city of Regina. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to stand on their shoulders, to be surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, we pray that you would remind us and that this plaque would be a reminder that you have called us to step out beyond our own doors, to step into our neighborhoods and to proclaim this same gospel and to see that work continue. We pray these things in Jesus name. Amen.
Well, again, um, welcome. We are um, in our new sermon series called Christ and the Art of Warfare. Um, we've been focused here at Northview on discipleship since September. That's our ministry theme for this year, growing as the disciples in Jesus Christ. And I wonder if maybe you notice, like I have, that when we pursue a deeper spiritual relationship with God, that life seems to coincidentally get a little bit harder. Well, of course, that's no accident. We know that there is an enemy who does not want us to belong to God or to grow deeper in God. So whether we are mature Christians or we are a new Christian or you are here because you're spiritually seeking, it is vital for us to understand that there are forces at work in this world that are attempting to derail us as we are seeking God. There is a wonderful quote by C.S. Lewis that's up on your screen. And there C.S. Lewis is um, talking about in his book, The Screwtape Letters. Uh, it's a fictional work, of course. It's from a, a senior devil writing and giving advice to a junior devil. And that's the second chapter when um, Wormwood's patient um, has become a Christian. And then uh, after some threats and almost glee at the torture Wormwood's going to receive, Screwtape, Uncle Screwtape is actually able to say, well, don't worry about it. No need to despair. Loads of these adult converts have, uh, have come and taken a, a temporary sojourn through the enemy's camp. And then they have come out again and are securely with us here in hell. So that is just an imaginative way that Lewis points out to Christians or warn Christians that we have to pay attention to the spiritual realm and the warfare that is occurring every day when we pursue God. We see this same battle most clearly when we come to the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes onto the scene, and if we take his entire childhood, the entire birth narratives that we've been examining over Advent and Christmas— we see that, that there is a conspiracy against Jesus himself. And so by the time he gets to um, the wilderness after his baptism, and he is tempted and tested by the devil as he has those 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, we are unsurprised. And the authors of the Gospels often say that the devil left Jesus at that time to look for an opportune time when he can test him again. And, and within Jesus' ministry, we see him constantly coming up against demons everywhere he turns. Jesus comes, and with him comes the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of darkness is instantly rattled, and the battle is on. Well, it's not just in the life of Jesus that this sort of battle occurs, is it? No, it is also in the Christian life. In fact, often the scriptures describe the Christian life using this kind of terminology, this sort of metaphor of battle or struggle. The Christian life is a struggle. We are to struggle against evil, against sin. It's a struggle for the faith. There's a struggle for the gospel. We are um, called soldiers. We are to wear armors, we have armor, we have weapons for warfare, and we are to engage in that warfare. All of that imagery is found in scripture for the Christian person. So as we come to discipleship, we recognize that as we grow as disciples, we are going to have greater spiritual in interference. And so we, we need to look at the battle plan. So that's what this series is going to be, Christ and the Art of War. So in this series, our battle plan is, first, we're going to examine the enemy, get to know the enemy. That's a must. And then we have to recognize that it is Jesus who is our general, who is leading the charge. And if we are going to fight well, we have to follow after him. Uh, we have to study our enemy's strategy. We have to know the way the enemy works so that we can outfox the fox. We have to stay together. 
Um, we have to watch out for stragglers on the margins. We have to keep our formation. We can't let anything break us apart. And we have to be familiar with our weapons so that we can use them appropriately at the right time. So let's start in on this series. Who are we fighting when we talk about this enemy? Who is it that we are describing? There is a, a classic book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And he says in that, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So probably the classic book on war strategy recommends and acknowledges that the first thing we have to do is to know our enemy and to know ourself. And in this sermon, we're hoping that we are going to clarify both of those things. So check out Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. Our text this morning is going to be Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. We're going to start with the first three verses. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So the Apostle Paul here is picturing um, with the Ephesian churches. He says, okay, think about your life before Christ. Now he may be talking about particularly Gentile Christians. Think about your life before Christ. I don't know for sure, but he says, what I have to say is about before you came to Christ. You were dead in your transgressions and sin. That is a fine summary for who we are as human beings apart from Christ and the Spirit. We are people that are already dead. Dead in sin, dead in transgressions. And we don't need to make too, too much about that. Paul's using both of those words synonymously as a way to intensify it. And so... Paul says you were literally the walking dead. We were spiritually separated from God. Um, dead. There's no other way to put it. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, but it wasn't just you guys. It wasn't just you Gentiles. Um, if the we that he's using is the Jewish people, then he's saying we also. And that would match uh, the way Paul talks in Romans as well. And he says, we're all in the same boat, guys. It's not that you're particularly evil. It's not that your sin and transgression were worse than ours. You were dead in sin and transgression. And so were we dead in, sermon, in sin and transgression. In fact, Paul says we were all deserving of wrath. To be objects of wrath is to um, be the object of God's judgment. God's wrath is God's love burning hot. But it also is judgment. Um, when God says this is good or not good, that is God's wrath. And Paul says before Christ and the Spirit, we were all alike. Dead in our sins and transgressions, deserving of judgment and under God's judgment, under God's wrath. Particularly what we want to see in this, as we ask the question, who are we fighting or who is our enemy? is to see um, what Paul has to say about that because Paul is summarizing what Scripture itself has to say about who is God's enemy. Because ultimately, while we are affected, it is God's enemies that are affecting us. And Paul names three in, that, in those first three verses. He names the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, we, a couple of weeks ago, we, um, we just did a sermon from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where we talked about loving enemies. And I concluded that way saying um, that that young kid who had said that the only enemy the Christian is to have is the devil. I, and I concluded and said he was in fact right. 
we should only have the enemy of the world, the flesh and the devil, because everybody else we should love. Love until they are no longer our enemy and then keep on loving them. And so here we are again. Um, the three enemies of God and of the church are the world, the flesh, and the devil. So in this sermon, what we want to do is get to know those three powers a little better. So we begin with the world. Paul says, you follow the ways of this world. In fact, Paul says it was the age of this world. And here we have this language of age. Now, on Easter, we talked about the old age and the new age. In Jesus, the new age has begun. But the old age hasn't finished yet. So you and I as Christians, and actually the whole world, even though the world doesn't recognize it or acknowledge it, are living in this in-between time. The new age has begun, but the old age continues. And so we, where we stand continues to be the old age, even though from a status point of view, you and I have moved into the new age. But because we stand in the old age, the old age, the world, continues to have influence and impact on who we are. That is the reality of being sort of stuck in between the two places. So, even though the old age is passing away in favor of the new age to come, um, it hasn't finished yet. And as Paul says in Romans 8, we are eagerly waiting in anticipation for the culminate, culmination of our salvation. So, the world. When we talk about the world, uh, I like Walter Wink. He says it this way. It seems to me the quality of alienated existence, the general spiritual climate that influences humanity in which we live and move and lose our beings, we breathe it, absorb it, and drink it in as the normative definition of our possibilities. It represents the subjectivity of a world epoch, the spirituality of the age, the permissions, license, restrictions, advices, and restraints imposed by the times we live in. So there's a description of what we mean by the world. It's this whole system of influence that the culture has out there around us. Think of the movie The Godfather for a second. We have this young man, Michael Corleone, who is a part of this mob family. In fact, his father is the Godfather, this crime boss, this head of this large organized crime family. And Michael is looking to get out. He is trying to go a different way. He's joined the army. He's marrying a non-Italian woman. He has a whole picture of what his life is going to be. He's trying to pull away from the culture of the family. And yet, upon the murder of his father, he is quickly pulled right back in. And in fact, that's a line from the third movie. Um, where he's constantly forced to be the son that he was designed to be, even though he wants to walk a different path. The Apostle Paul says this in a really uh, neat way. And the J.B. Phillips translation of Romans 12, 2 brings out what we're trying to say. What it is that the world attempts to do to you and to me. Paul says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. So think about the times when you've made popsicles or chocolates. You get a mold and you pour the liquid or the contents in there. Maybe you freeze them and then you're able to take it. And the, the shape of that thing, the popsicle or the chocolate, has taken on the shape of the mold. And so that's the way the world works on everybody. Believers and non-believers alike. It attempts to squeeze us into one particular mold. And when we think about the world, we have to recognize that the world does not tolerate non-conformity. The world does not like it when we stand apart and try to be different. The world is, in fact, trying to squeeze us into its mold. And we're hitting the world view. Um, this is the way the world says the world works. And so whenever we challenge those assumptions, we're going to have either, either revolution or we're going to have revolt, violence. So either the world changes, and we have seen world change, um, or it hits back. And it just says, no, 
We will not tolerate that changing. So the first enemy is the world. There is a whole context that we live in that is always trying to conform us to itself. The second enemy that Paul talks about is the flesh. And here we're, we're moving out of order a little bit from the way that Paul said it. Paul says, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Now, the first thing we have to note is that this is not about the material body. So this isn't about the, the flesh-spirit dualism, um, as if the flesh is bad, the physical body is bad, and the inner self is good, a spirit is good. No, when Paul is talking about flesh in this context, he is talking about our lives apart from God, the part of ourselves that either doesn't take God into account at all or hates and rejects God. So the person that does not pursue God at all, but rather pursue, uh, prefers the self-gratification of our own desires. And so uh, notice in that, in that verse, following the flesh's desires and thoughts. It's almost described as a personality. And in fact, when we go to Romans uh, 5 to 8, that is exactly the way that the Apostle Paul talks about it. Um, sin as this thing that dwells in us. It's almost like a second skin, a second self. And so Paul in Romans 7 has this whole diatribe where he says, now look at what happens when the law comes in. The law says not to do something, and the very first thing I wanted to do is do that thing. So there's a part of me that agrees that the law is good, I shouldn't do that thing, but then there's another part of me that wants to do that thing, leads me to do that thing, and I end up doing the evil that I don't want to do, and I don't do the good that I do want to do, and I find that I am at war within myself. That war there is the person in the sinful human nature, the flesh. That's what Paul is talking about when he describes the flesh. And so this enemy um, seeks to pull us along through our desires and our thoughts. It's not just some base um, physical instinct. We sin with our mind as well. And again, like with the world, that's why Paul says, don't be conformed to the or squeezed into the mold of this world, but be transformed through the renewal of your mind. But Paul says, if we follow these desires and thoughts, if we allow the flesh to lead us where it wants to go, then in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, we have this description of what happens when we actually indulge and follow those um, desires and thoughts of the flesh. Paul says there, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. So think of literally almost any college movie, American Pie, Animal House. It, it will show you exactly, well, don't watch them, but they show you exactly uh, what Paul is talking about. This is what it looks like if we are uh, pursuing the flesh, if we allow its desires and its thoughts to lead us. And so in Romans 13, 14, Paul is concluding and he sums up and he tells us the way we need to operate is to not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So instead, we are called to follow the, the leading of the Spirit rather than the leading of our flesh in Romans. So we have the world, the flesh, and finally, we have the devil. Now, I love the movie, The Usual Suspects, <clears throat> and I've used the quote several times. Um, in that movie, we have Vir Virgil Kent saying, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince the world he didn't exist. And we have, to, we have to come to terms with that. We live in a world where it just seems silly to actually believe in a devil. 
some personification of evil. So when Paul talks in Ephesians uh, 2, and he says, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, we know that he's talking about Satan there. And there's lots of titles that scripture holds for this, this enemy of God. He's known as Satan, Belilo, and the God of this age. He is the devil. And so we recognize that there is a personality that has a malevolent mind. One author says, um, Satan is vested with a sovereignty, however limited it might ultimately be, that is powerful, compelling, and clearly opposed to the work of God in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Apostle Paul says, The God of this age, and by that again he means the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the devil is in the world. He, he works against us, and he is working against us on us. Uh, Arnold says, uh, The devil is an intelligent powerful spirit being that is thoroughly evil and is directly involved in perpetrating evil in the lives of individuals as well as on a much larger scale. So we have this, this picture of this being that we have to take seriously if we are going to be armed to, to fight this fight. The Apostle James says in chapter 4 verse 7, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil is the enemy from of old that from the very beginning has been resisting and attempting to corrupt the work of God. And he continues to try to corrupt it. Um, now, here are the three individuals then you, we could say. The world, the flesh, and the devil. But they're not three separate enemies. They, they don't just work independently of one another. So that we're being hit or miss from one or the other. No, it's a, a collaborated effort. They work in concert together. So, Anderson says this. In talking about the world, the flesh, and the devil, we need to understand that it is not all one or all the other. Most of the time, it is not even mostly one or the other. They work together, and we need a strategy for resistance that takes into account all three without allowing an emphasis on one of them to dominate. So think about the three-headed dragon from mythology. That's kind of a mental picture that we can have when we talk about these three enemies. Um, yes, they're three separate things, but they work in concert, um, and they're all the more ferocious and dangerous as a result. So our situation then, if we are to know our enemy, is to recognize that we have both an external and internal um, tension that is going on. We have the world outside of us. We have the flesh within us. And so those things are at war. And then all of that is orchestrated by this malevolent mind in the person of Satan that is designing to pull us from the very arms of Jesus, to blind us if he can, and to remove us from the security of our faith. That is who we are fighting. But don't worry. Take it seriously, but don't worry. I love in 1 John 4, 4, the apostle says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them, the, the, the powers in the world, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So let's go to the, the but now. So Paul, in the first three verses of Ephesians 2, has described the life of the believers before Christ. And then he says, but God. So in verse 4, he says, but 
because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So those of us in Christ, we have been raised with Christ and we have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We have been joined to Christ. So we need to take these things seriously again because we're in the in-between times, but we must not fear. We don't need to see the devil behind every um, bush. We know that Jesus Christ has already won the victory and what we are called to do is to join ourselves and to be found in Christ. More about that next week when we talk about following our leader. So um, the battle is won. We are in Christ Jesus. For those who are, are seeking the only protection for sorry, those who are spiritually seeking um, then I want to put out to you that the only protection we have from the world, the flesh, and the devil is the person and victory of Jesus Christ through his death and his resurrection. And I would appeal to you to throw yourself or abandon yourself to his lordship and his salvation. We also have to remember that the, the battle isn't even it isn't like Satan or the devil or the world, the flesh and the devil altogether are a match for, for God. This is not an even fight. Um, God far outweighs. In a moment, a snap of his finger, he can do away with all of those things. So. We know the, the ending already. Christ has won the battle. And as he comes again, all the, the in-between stuff is going to finally be put away. When the kingdom of God will be complete. And all that remains are those that are in Christ. So, yes, we're in the in-between stage between the already and the not yet. But these powers are still in operation uh, so they're defeated, but they're not completely broken yet. So think of the book uh, Lord of the Rings. You have Sorum in the White who, who uh, betrays and becomes a traitor, becomes Sorum in of, of many colors. And as the victory is won by Aragorn and the hobbits, um, they're starting to come back and they need to deal with Sorum. In, and there's a whole conversation. And Gandalf says um, he, he's schooling them to be careful about their conversation and the question is raised, well, why do we have to be careful? Isn't he defeated? Isn't he a fangless serpent? And Soramin is described as having one tooth still. So while he is weak, he still has some power and can still do some damage. That is a beautiful description of the powers, world flesh and the devil. Um, they are not completely broken yet. They can do damage still, and that's why we have to take them seriously, although we don't take them with ultimate seriousness. Only Christ has ultimate seriousness. So what do we need to do in response as we respond to these things that we have heard? Well, here's a, a list of things. Number one, come to Christ. If you are not a Christian, you're a spiritually seeking person, um, come to Christ. If you are a Christian uh, and are struggling with spiritual attack, come to Christ. Um, our protection and our salvation is always in Christ Jesus. Understand the fierceness of the battles. So um, eyes open. Uh, the, the current language these days is called woke. Be woke to the world that we live in. The world, the flesh, and the devil are all actively conspiring every day um, to derail us and pull us from the arms of Jesus Christ. Focus on your discipleship. 
the more we grow in maturity, the more we become like Christ Jesus himself, the more victory we ourselves will have over these powers in our lives. Um, so grow in your maturity, be disciple. Fix your expectations, set your expectations so they are appropriate expectations. Um, the Christian life is not the waving of the wand, the Jesus is not the bippity boppity boo that is going to fix everything. We need to understand that this battle is a lifelong battle. We will be fighting this until the day we die or until the day that Christ comes again and puts those powers finally under his feet. So think of it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so don't think that you can do one thing, say one prayer, and life is going to be cotton candy and unicorns. Um, it is going to be a lifelong struggle towards freedom. And finally, seek deliverance. Uh, if you are experiencing uh, spiritual interference, uh, then let us know. We want to pray with you. There are people in our congregation that work with Freedom in Christ, Ed and Linda, and they can help take you through steps to deliverance. Uh, we have a wonderful prayer team that is praying even now and will do intercession and will meet with you. We have pastors who can, can meet with you right now electronically and do some of that. There are counselors that you can go to. Um, so seek deliverance from this. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we thank you for this great gospel truth. Help us to be aware of the enemies that we are facing, the way in which they work, the way that they attempt to um, disrupt our relationship with you. But most of all, draw us to yourself. Give us the strength and the desire to pursue you rather than the works of the flesh. Rather than uh, hearing Satan's voice, help us to hear the voice of the Spirit. Rather than being conformed into the image of the world, we desire for you to conform us to the image of your Son. Free us, we pray, and make that freedom, that deliverance complete. For those in our congregation um, and beyond who are affected spiritually, we pray for, for release, for deliverance. We pray that if they are not a part of our community, that they would find a good Christian community where they can receive some of that healing and deliverance ministry. And we pray for the household here at Northview, that you would give them the courage to come forward so that we can see them freed and delivered as well. Lord, again, we want to be in prayer for the situation that we are in collectively as a world. We thank you for the great news that the numbers are improving here in Saskatchewan, and we continue to pray for wisdom as we move forward, continuing to take these good precautions so that um, it will be clear altogether. And we pray that for the rest of the world as well, Lord. We recognize that there are people who are growing tired, people who are, are afraid and are afraid that their rights or freedoms are being stripped from them, people who believe this is a hoax. And I, this can lead to some unwise behavior. Lord, we pray for wisdom, your wisdom to be poured out. We pray for people to continue their good precautions. We pray, Lord, that you would limit the, the death toll. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for those who are afraid. And we pray for those who are lonely. We pray for your power and your presence to move in this world, to set people free, to bring healing and renewal, new life, Lord, resurrection life. So, Lord, for all of these good gifts that you have given us, we bless your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, and here's our...
our sending. Again from Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Be blessed.